In this video tutorial, we will introduce the concepts of population dynamics and how to create population graphs. If you recall, population is defined as all the individuals of a single species living in the same area. So they must be the same species and they must live in the same area to be considered a population. So when we talk about population dynamics, we're talking about the study of how populations will change over time. Now, as many of you know, mice can reproduce very quickly. In fact, they can give birth to new babies every six weeks. So what prevents their population from growing uncontrollably? Well, that would be the carrying capacity for the ecosystem. So if you recall, the carrying capacity is defined as the maximum population size that can be supported by an ecosystem. In general, there are four factors that will determine carrying capacity. The first factor is materials and energy. Populations are limited by the amount of usable energy from the sun and the availability of water and other vital nutrients in that ecosystem. The more materials and energy they have, the higher the population that can be supported. Food chains is the next factor. Population sizes are dependent on the size of the trophic levels above and below it. So looking at this fish in the middle as an example, if there's a large number of predators, then its population will be decreased. And vice versa, if there's not a lot of creatures trying to eat it, its population will increase. But the same goes for the trophic level below it. If there's a lot of food for it to eat, its population will increase. But if there's not a lot of food for it to eat, its population will decrease. So food chains is another factor that affects carrying capacity. The next factor is competition, both intraspecific and interspecific. Competition is defined as the demand for resources, such as food, water, mates, space, etc., etc. Now, intraspecific means competition within the same species. So if a wolf was competing with another wolf for food, or for water, or for mates, then that would be intraspecific competition. Interspecific competition is between different species. So maybe a wolf competing with a coyote. All right, so they're both competing for the same uh, food to hunt, maybe for water, uh, probably not mates, but definitely for space. How I like to memorize this is international. The word international has the prefix inter inside of it. And international means between two nations. So if I'm on an international flight, I'm flying between two nations. Well, interspecific means between two species. So if there's a lot of competition for resources like food, water, or space, then your population won't be very high because that environment can't support so many individuals. And that's why they're competing so much for all the resources. And the final factor that affects carrying capacity is density. All organisms need space. If the ecosystem has a lot of space, then it can accommodate a large population. If it doesn't have a lot of space, then it can only accommodate a smaller population. Now when it comes to density, there are two major factors that will affect the carrying capacity of an environment. And that is density independent factors and density dependent factors. Natural disasters are usually good examples of density independent factors. They affect a population regardless of how crowded it is. So for instance, whether I have five penguins living here or 500 penguins living here, that has no effect on whether an earthquake will or will not occur. Having more penguins does not mean you'll have more earthquakes. However, having more penguins stuck together in a crowded area is more likely to result in disease being passed around. So disease and food supply are examples of density dependent factors. So if you had very few penguins living together, then you don't have to worry about disease or amount of food as much as you would if there were a lot of penguins living together. All right, moving ahead. So any factor that can improve or increase your population is called a growth factor, or the fancy word for that is biotic potential. Meanwhile, any factor that will decrease your population is known as a decrease factor or an environmental resistance. So what I want you to do right now is for each of these factors below, determine if it is biotic, meaning results from living things, or abiotic, resulting from non-living things, and whether or not it will increase or decrease the population. All right, so let's go over one example together and you can do the rest yourself. Insufficient or excess temperature. So if it's too cold or too hot. Now is temperature biotic or abiotic? Well, temperature is abiotic. It is non-living. Now, if you have extremely cold temperatures 
or extremely high temperatures, will that increase or decrease your population? Well, most organisms prefer uh, moderate temperatures over excessive temperatures, so this will actually decrease your population. All right, so I want you to press pause and work on the rest of this table. When you're ready, press play and we'll continue on with our lesson. Okay, on to our next topic. How do populations change size? So populations can change size through births, also known as natality, so that's the fancy word for that. So when an organism is born into a population, it increases the population. And of course, deaths, known as mortality, reduces a population. Another way to increase a population is through immigration. That is migrating into a new habitat to increase a population. And the opposite of immigration is emigration, when you leave your habitat to go somewhere else. Together, these factors are used to calculate the net population growth, all right, to see what is happening to your population. Is it increasing or is it decreasing overall? So births and immigration will add to your population, while deaths and emigration will reduce your population. If you have more here than here, then overall you have a positive net growth. If you lose more than you gain, then overall you'll have a negative net growth. Some key terms to keep in mind, a zero population growth occurs when the population doesn't change. So typically when this number and this number are identical, then you have no change. If one person is born but one person dies, your net population doesn't change. A population explosion, on the other hand, occurs when the population is undergoing a very rapid and uncontrolled growth. There are many reasons for this, but we'll explore that in a few moments. Finally, a population crash occurs when there's an exact opposite, a rapid decrease in your population. Typically, this occurs when the carrying capacity has been exceeded. Now, to help us visualize this information a little bit better, we plot it all onto a population growth curve. A population growth curve typically has a sigmoidal shape. Sigmoidal is just a fancy word for S-shaped, so it kind of has an S-shape, I guess. In any case, there are three major distinct regions to a typical uh, growth curve. Uh, don't worry about region D, we'll talk about that in a few moments, but these are the three regions that we are going to be focusing upon for now. The first region is the region of slow growth. So A, region A over here, slow growth. Notice how the uh, curve is not very steep. This typically occurs for two major reasons. The first reason is maybe the organisms were just introduced to this new ecosystem, and they are still trying to adjust or adapt to the new environment. Now that they're in a new area, they need to find out where's all the food, where's all the water, where's all the shelter, what kind of predators are there. They're too busy trying to survive, so reproducing is not a priority for them. Usually animals do not create babies unless they know that they can uh, take care of the babies and the babies will survive, otherwise it's a waste of energy and resources. Now the second major reason why the population may not be increasing quickly is that perhaps only a small number of the individuals are sexually mature and able to reproduce. Once an animal is born, it does take time for it to reach puberty before it could have babies of its own. Now the second region is called the region of rapid growth, also known as the population explosion region. Now that the organisms have adapted and adjusted to the environmental conditions, they found their food, they found their shelter, they know how to survive the predators and hide from them, they can uh, concentrate on pre-producing at this point. Furthermore, any animals that were born in this period have now reached sexual maturity and they too can have their own babies to add to the population. Now the final region over here is known as the region of steady growth. In this part of the graph, the carrying capacity has been reached, the population growth becomes constant. So the environment can no longer support a higher population. However, there will be some small changes from year to year, but that generally hovers in and around the carrying capacity. So maybe one year you have a lot of food, but the next year you have very little food. The next year maybe a lot more food, but it generally hovers in and around the carrying capacity for that particular environment. And that accounts for the small fluctuations in the population. So these are the three major areas. Uh, the first area, of course, slow growth, where they're still adjusting, adapting to the environment. So they're too busy trying to survive. Uh, they're not focusing on reproduction. The second area is where they have now adapted to the new environment. And so now they can start to focus upon reproduction. And at that point, you see a population explosion. And the final region shows steady growth, where the number of deaths and uh, emigration equals the number of births and immigration and so you're not changing your uh, population very much because that is how much 
your carrying capacity can allow. That's how much the ecosystem can hold in terms of the, for that particular population. Uh, obviously, from year to year, things will change. Maybe one year you have a lot more food, another year you have less food, but overall, the population hovers around the carrying capacity for that ecosystem. Now, this region over here, labeled D, is known as the dieback region or the population crash region. Typically, this occurs if the population overshoots the uh, carrying capacity by a lot, and now suddenly it's catching up to them. Organisms generally don't keep track of how much resources or how much food is available to them and whether they should save it for next year or not. And so what they'll do is they'll just keep eating and eating and eating and reproducing and reproducing until finally they realize there's not enough food for everyone. And so some of the organisms at that point will starve to death and die. Once enough of the population has died, that will give the ecosystem enough time to regenerate its resources, thereby allowing the population again to increase. All right, so looking at the bottom over here, we see this image. This is a population curve for humans. And you'll notice that for most of our history, our population never rose above half a billion people until the last thousand years. But with the advent of modern medicine and modern technology, the Industrial Revolution, our population has begun to skyrocket. We are now in the exponential phase. But if you look back over here, what is after the population explosion phase? It's a dieback. So the question is, at what point will humans reach the carrying capacity for our Earth? Something to think about. All right. So the next topic we're going to look at is uh, the reindeer population activity. For this, you'll need to go back to your Google Classroom and inside your assignment page, uh, click on the population activity Excel spreadsheet file. You'll notice there's nothing you can do over here. So click on the three dots in the top right hand corner and click on open a new window. And this will give you the option to open with and choose Google Sheets. Once the file is loaded, let's read the instructions. So the reindeer population graph activity basically says that in an attempt to increase the local food supply for people, humans introduced 28 reindeer, 24 females and 4 males, to an island off the coast of Alaska in December of 1975. The following data shows the changes in the reindeer population from 1976 to 1998. What we're going to do is we're going to plot a properly labeled reindeer population graph and use it to answer the remaining questions on our homework assignment sheet. All right, so looking at the top over here, 1976, here's some information. These are how many births during each of the years that we've been looking at, the deaths that occurred during those years, well, how many uh, reindeer immigrated into the area, and how many emigrated out of the area. And what we need to do is we need to calculate what is the total population at the end of each year. So looking back at the instructions, it says that at the end of 1975, we had 28 reindeer. So going over here, so I'm going to open up my calculator and type in 28 reindeer to start off with. Since I have two births in 1976 and births add to my population, I'm going to say plus 2. And I had one death, so I'm going to go minus 1, deaths removed from your population. I had zero immigration, but immigration usually adds to your population, so plus 0. Emigration means they're leaving your area, so I'm going to say minus zero. And that means at the end of 1976, I should have 29 reindeer. All right, so once again, we started off with 28 reindeer at the end of 1975. Two births, plus two. One death, minus one. Zero immigration, plus zero. Zero emigration, minus zero. We end up with 29. If I want to find out how many reindeer I have at the end of 1977, I'm going to take my 29 and do this. Plus 4 births, minus 2 deaths, and of course plus 0 immigration, minus 0 immigration, but in the end you get 31. Oops. So what I want you to do now is press pause and continue doing this for 1978 and 1979. So tell me what are the final numbers in 1978 based on this data over here, and then what is the final number for 1979 based on this data over here. Press pause when you're ready and you've got the two numbers, press play and we'll take it up together. All right, so let's see how you did. We start off with 31 reindeer at the end of 1977, but during 1978 we had six that were born, so plus six. We had two that died, so minus Two. Uh, zero immigration, so if you want to, you can write down plus zero. 
but two emigrations, so two reindeers left this area. So minus two equals 33. So I'm going to type that in, 33, and I can move on to the next one. All right, so we start with 33. We had nine births, so plus nine. We had one death, so minus one. We had two immigration, so two came in, so plus two. And then we had one emigration, so one reindeer left the area, so minus one. And we get a 42, and I'll type that in. All right. Now, instead of calculating everything from this point on manually by yourself, there is a way, a little shortcut, to allow Excel to do the calculations for you. This is a very useful tool to have, and uh, if you ever go into the sciences or the maths, you will definitely be using it again. So here's what you're going to do. Click on the cell over here and press the equal button. When you press equals, you're telling Excel that you want it to do a calculation for you. So what do you want? We're going to click on this guy over here to say F5. So that's why it says F5. So whatever number is F5, what I want to do now is plus sign, add this value over here, 13. But instead of saying 13, Excel sees it as B6. So notice how it's B6. Now, because deaths is a subtraction, I'm going to press the minus sign. And I'm going to select C6. So now it knows to uh, subtract whatever is in C6. Immigration is an addition. So I'm going to press the plus sign. And then I'm going to click on this uh, D6 at this point. So now it knows to add whatever is in D6. And then a minus sign again. Subtract whatever is in E6. So now Excel knows that I'm going to take whatever number was up here, F5, sub, uh, add it to the B6, subtract C6, add D6, and subtract E6. Press Enter, and it calculates it for you. Now here's where the magic starts. We can get Excel to repeat this equation for us. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag this little blue square at the bottom right-hand corner, click on it, and drag it over the rest of the chart, all the way up to 1998. Once I let go, everything is calculated for me. So if you look at this one over here, click on this, notice how it calls it F6, so whatever was here, plus B7, minus C7, plus D7, minus E7 gives you this number. And then if I look at the next cell, look at the equation here for this one, it says whatever was F7, F7, repeat that same equation, that same pattern over and over and over again. And this saves you so much time. So that's one of the great features of Excel. I typically use this feature whenever I'm doing some mindless calculations that can be repeated over and over and over again. The next thing we're going to do now is we want to uh, create a graph. So what I want you to do is highlight this entire column, year, all the way to the bottom here, 1998. Scroll to the top, hold the control key on your keyboard. So on the keyboard, there should be a control button. Hold down on it, and then highlight this section as well. That way I can uh, select two columns all at once. Okay, to the end, and then let go. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert and click chart, and it will graph it for me. So here's the graph that it's created. I don't like it just floating around like this, so I'm going to click the three dots over here, and then I'm going to say move to own sheet. And now open it up as its own chart. I'm going to double click this and say graph. Now the next thing we want to do is clean it up. I want to change this title. Let's call it figure 1.0 reindeer population from 1976 to 1998. Now the next thing I want to do is uh, to show the data points on the graph itself. So I'm going to go over to the settings over here and choose series. Once I click on series, uh, I'm going to say point size. Let's make it 7 pixels. And there are my dots for each of my data points. Makes it easier for me to identify uh, what year was what and when did things happen. All right, so using this graph and using the population data sets from this chart over here, you can now answer the questions on your PDF file and upload it to our Google Classroom. All right, that's it, and good luck. If you have any questions, please ask your teacher.